Item number, SCP-226. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-226 is to be kept in a locked cabinet within the site secure item storage unit. Any person wishing to use SCP-226 must have approval from any personnel with at least level 3 security clearance. Description SCP-226 is a cardboard box measuring roughly 30 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 4 centimeters. It has a lid that fits securely over the bottom half, as with any common puzzle box. The surface of the box is a deep black, with the word fear scrawled with white ink on the upper right corner of its lid. Within the box are 1,000 cardboard puzzle pieces, each measuring roughly 2 centimeters in diameter, also considered SCP-226. When completed, the puzzle always forms in a rectangular shape. However, the design and order in which the pieces fit together change with use. SCP-226 aligns itself with whoever initially opens the box. When opened, the pieces change design, and the completed image will show what has been discovered to be the greatest fear of the person who it is aligned to. The image on the pieces do not change after the box has been opened. Recorded images on SCP-226 are as follows. A bloated corpse, sinking underwater. A set of gallows with several nooses attached. A person screaming, with hundreds of small spiders crawling out of his mouth. A darkened window with a mutilated hand scraping across it. SCP-682 A human figure completely covered in various insects, such as bees or centipedes. The cross-section of a coffin buried in dirt, with a person inside, slamming her fists on inside of the lid. When completed and taken back apart, the lid of SCP-226's box will fly through the air and secure itself back on the lower half. The puzzle pieces will disappear, presumably returning back into the box. SCP-226 will then become unaligned and align itself with the next person to open the box. Additional Notes SCP-226 was first discovered by now-defunct Mobile Task Force 12 in 19... At the time, the task force was investigating reports of a possible SCP in a series of tunnels underneath a church in the city of Data Expunged. Due to an equipment malfunction, MTF-12 had lost communication with the surface and was stranded within the tunnels until repairs were made. The task force discovered SCP-226 on a wooden table within a stone room surrounded by several chairs. Believing it to be a simple puzzle, MTF-12 decided to open SCP-226 to pass the time. When depicted, SCP-226 depicted the exact scene of MTF-12 sitting at the table working on a puzzle. However, Agent T appeared to be viciously stabbing several other members of the task force with a standard-issue combat knife. The puzzle was taken apart, transporting back to its box. Repairs were soon made, and MTF-12 returned to the surface. Note, regrettably, an accident en route to the surface caused the death of Agent T. Item Number SCP-228 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-228 will be used to conduct experimental psychiatric testing at Site-23. SCP-228 is to be kept under glass in Observation Room 113 ADC at Site-23. Access to Observation Room 113 ADC will require either Level 4 authorization or a signed notification from Medical Director Light. Observation Room 113 ADC is to be monitored by no fewer than four high-definition video cameras and a reinforced one-way observation mirror running the full length of the east wall. When a subject observes SCP-228, the reaction is to be documented by no fewer than five researchers stationed behind the observation mirror, as well as the subject's accompanying psychiatrist. Description SCP-228 is a Polaroid photograph of variable appearance. It is apparent at this time that SCP-228 derives its subject matter from the subconscious mind of the viewer. The images produced are always visually clear, but vary in interpretive coherency. For example, 
One viewer may cause SCP-228 to manifest a clear portrait of that viewer's father, while another causes an image of a heart-shaped object, submerged in green fluid to The coherence of the image produced by SCP-228 appears to vary from subject to subject and is theorized to have some connection to the viewer's emotional state. SCP-228's various image manifestations can be photographed normally, although the photographs will not display the ability to manifest new images. It will manifest an image when viewed remotely by video feed. After SCP-228 has manifested an image, it will remain inert, displaying the same image until that viewer looks away. At that point, it will adapt its manifestation to reflect that of the current viewer. The question of what SCP-228 manifests when unobserved is moot. SCP-228 will be used to assist members of the psychiatric staff at Site-23. During psychoanalysis, the patient, hereafter referred to as the subject, will be asked leading questions and instructed to look at SCP-228. Once the manifestation has been recorded, the subject will be instructed to look away. At no point should the interviewer view SCP-228 before the subject, as this will corrupt the record and potentially skew psychoanalysis of the subject. Addendum As of No personnel who have previously been exposed to a visual mimetic agent is authorized for exposure to SCP-228 due to the possibility of subsequent data expunged. Item Number SCP-241 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-241 is to be kept at Site-19 using standard operating procedures for containing Safe Class Book and Manuscript Type SCPs with the following additional conditions. SCP-241 must be kept open on a flat surface with restraints across opposing pages of the open book to keep it from closing accidentally. Containment devices must be checked at least once a week for structural integrity. Any anomalies must be reported immediately to Site Command. Access to SCP-241 is restricted. Any and all usage of SCP-241 must be logged. SCP-241 must be transported in an authorized book stand, such that it cannot accidentally be closed in transit. In the event that SCP-241 is opened outside of a testing environment, the last person to have touched it must report to the nearest infirmary, and a D-Class personnel must close and reopen SCP-241. Description SCP-241 appears as a normal book, 33 cm by 23 cm by 3.5 cm, entitled Good Home Cooking. The cover of SCP-241 is a red and white checkerboard pattern with the title in simple black letters on the front and spine. When open, SCP-241 contains 99 recipes, sorted into typical sections of a cookbook. Many of these recipes include a picture of the dish that is invariably appetizing, and a small percentage will call for rare or exotic ingredients. Whenever SCP-241 is opened by a subject, known as the target, different from the one who last opened it, i.e. the previous target, the recipes contained in the book change. Preliminary investigations concluded that if the target eats a dish prepared from one of the recipes in SCP-241, that person soon dies from apparent anaphylactic shock. Others who eat the same dish are not similarly affected. Testing has been authorized to determine the exact nature of SCP-241's effects. SCP-241 appears to be impervious to getting dirty and to at least minor damage. For example, Sauces splashed onto its pages disappear almost immediately, and torn pages and nicks on the cover are repaired within seconds. Research on SCP-241 continues, including potential interaction with other SCP items. Experiment Log 241-L02 Supplemental Testing on SCP-241 Just as in initial testing, all tests on SCP-241 were carried out in test kitchens at Site-19 using D-Class personnel for test subjects, unless otherwise indicated. Test 24121 Subject Subject 241J was chosen from general population. Health screenings indicate subject is allergic to peanuts. Procedure Subject was instructed to close and open SCP-241 several times at prescribed intervals. Each time SCP-241 was opened, 
the complete contents of SCP-241 were recorded and transcribed while subject underwent testing. Results Test results indicated the subject's allergy to peanuts worsened each time subject opened SCP-241. Subject's allergy was most affected the first time he opened SCP-241, and subsequently opening SCP-241 appears to have diminishing effects. However, subject's allergy worsened from mild to severe. Most of the recipes in SCP-241 reappeared when subject closed and reopened SCP-241. Between 11 and 17 inclusive new recipes appeared each time SCP-241 was reopened. Recipes that had been replaced did not reappear. Only one exotic recipe was replaced after subject had opened SCP-241 for the fourth time. Analysis the effects of SCP-241 appear to follow the law of diminishing returns. SCP-241 also appears to tailor its choice of recipes to the specific condition of the target, though much more testing would be necessary to prove that theory. Suggest analysis of recipes offered during normal testing of SCP-241. Test 24122 Subject Subject 241K is a rhesus monkey. Health screenings indicated no apparent food allergies or other health problems. Procedure Subject was introduced to SCP-241 and encouraged to open it by handlers. Handlers were instructed to keep subject from closing SCP-241 again. Results Subject eventually opened SCP-241, and handlers kept it open for analysis. The contents of SCP-241 were consistent with previous results for a target with a shellfish allergy though again unique for the target. Testing confirmed subject had developed an allergy to shellfish. A dish was prepared from SCP-241 by Subject 241-F and presented to Subject 241-K. Subject 241-K ate the meal without hesitation and nine minutes later was dead from anaphylactic shock, consistent with previous testing. Analysis SCP-241 is just as effective on certain non-humans as it is on humans. The working theory now is that SCP-241 works on anything potentially susceptible to food allergies that can and does open SCP-241. Test 24123 Subject Subject 241-L is a robot designed for remote manipulation of hazardous materials. Procedure Subject was remote controlled by who was instructed to have the subject open SCP-241. Results Subject opened SCP-241 via remote control. The contents of SCP-241 were identical to before it was closed previously. Analysis SCP-241 apparently does not respond to inorganic targets. Test 24124 Subject Subject 241M 859E was chosen from general population. Health screenings indicated no allergies. Procedure Subject was exposed to SCP 859 via touch. Subject then placed within an MOPP 4 containment suit. Subject was given SCP 241 and instructed to open it and to keep it open. Results Tests on skin sample taken from subject confirmed development of severe allergy to spider venom, as per usual with contact with SCP-859. SCP-241 retained its previous set of recipes. Analysis SCP-241 apparently requires physical contact with subject. Test 24125 Subject Subject 241M 859E Procedure Subject given a standard Class D uniform. Subject was given SCP-241 and instructed to open it. Results Subject dropped SCP-241 to the floor and began screaming. Subject given a mild sedative. SCP-241 contained a set of arachnid-based and themed recipes. The meal, Mr. Skeleton's Halloween Spider Snacks, was selected and prepared from SCP-241 by Subject 241-F. Due to Subject 241-M 859-E having severe arachnophobia, data expunged. Within two minutes, the subject experienced breathing difficulties and partial paralysis. This was closely followed by the typical symptoms of anaphylaxis. 
Immediate administration of epinephrine did not prevent the subject from expiring. Analysis Although the images found in SCP-241 are typically considered pleasing or appetizing, it does not seem to have any particular sentience. Autopsy confirmed the presence of venom and neurotoxins produced by the Brazilian wandering spider. End Experiment Log Directive 241-S06 In light of recent test results with SCP-241, no further testing of SCP-241 on personnel without pre-existing food allergies is authorized, without Level 4 security clearance. Testing may continue on personnel with pre-existing food allergies. 05 Directive 241-S09 Reclassification of SCP-241 to Euclid class is denied. Honestly, the cookbook? Leave it in its room and everything's fine. It's no one else's fault if you don't know what you're allergic to and don't bother to find out beforehand. Unless you're cooking for your significant other, then you'd better know. 05 Directive 241-S11 Cross-testing SCP-241 with other SCPs will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Exposure to SCP-682 has already been considered and denied. 05 Addendum 1 Acquisition Summary The Foundation became aware of SCP-241 in April 2000 while investigating reports of a Black Widow in Said subject had been married four times, and all four of her husbands had died shortly after eating a meal at home. However, since authorities never found evidence of foul play, subject was never charged with any crime. Subsequent interviews with subject by Foundation personnel revealed the existence of SCP-241, at which time SCP-241 was seized by Foundation agents. Subject revealed that she had first realized there was something unusual with SCP-241 when data expunged. Addendum 2 Initial Testing Log All tests on SCP-241 were carried out in test kitchens at Site-19, using D-Class personnel for test subjects, unless otherwise noted. Test 241-1 Subject Subject 241A was chosen from general population. No unusual traits selected for. Procedure Subject 241A was presented SCP-241 while closed, and instructed to open it, choose a recipe, prepare it, and eat it, while giving feedback during the entire process. Results Before exposure to SCP-241, Subject declared that he had never cooked anything more complicated than ramen noodles. Subject opened SCP-241, reporting nothing unusual. Subject looked through recipes in SCP-241, choosing sautéed scallops in a white wine sauce. Subject prepared the sautéed scallops from the recipe in SCP-241, and when complete, remarked that he did not know he could do that. Subject declared that the prepared dish smelled fantastic, and while eating it, declared, This is the best thing I've ever eaten. Three minutes after completing the meal, subject started showing symptoms of anaphylactic shock. Subject was treated with emergency doses of epinephrine, but treatment was not effective. Subject died from anaphylactic shock six minutes afterward, later confirmed by autopsy. A subsequent examination of SCP-241 revealed that 81 of its recipes called for shellfish. SCP-241 was left open. Analysis Results are consistent with previous descriptions of the effects of SCP-241. Test 241-2 Subject Subject 241-B was chosen from general population. Subject reports no known allergies to scallops or other shellfish. Procedure SCP-241 was still open from test 241-1. Subject 241-B was instructed to not close SCP-241, find the sautéed scallops recipe, prepare it, and eat it, while giving feedback during the entire process. Results Before exposure to SCP-241, Subject expressed doubt that he'd be able to prepare the sautéed scallops recipe. After preparing the dish, Subject expressed surprise that he had done so, similarly to the reaction of Subject 241-A and said that the dish smells pretty good. While eating, Subject declared that the dish was pretty good, and again expressed surprise that he had cooked it. 
Subject did not suffer anaphylactic shock or any other adverse effect after completing the meal. Post-testing observation of subject revealed no long-term effects from eating the dish. SCP-241 was left open. Analysis Results are consistent with previous descriptions of the effects of SCP-241. Suspect that SCP-241 may somehow improve the cooking skill of whoever is preparing the dish. Test 241-3 Subject Subjects 241C and 241D were chosen from general population. Both subjects report no skill in cooking and no allergies to shellfish. Procedure SCP-241 was still open from test 2412. Subject 241C was instructed to not close SCP-241, find the sautéed scallops recipe, and transcribe it to a standard sheet of paper. In a separate test kitchen, Subject 241D was given the transcribed recipe and instructed to prepare and eat the dish prepared. Results Subject 241C found and transcribed the recipe without incident. The transcribed recipe was visually compared to the recipe in SCP-241 and confirmed to be identical. SCP-241 was left open. Subject displayed no adverse effects from interaction with SCP-241. Subject 241D was given the transcribed recipe and attempted to prepare the sautéed scallops, but experienced difficulty and frustration, several times declaring, I told you guys I can't cook. The completed dish did not look or smell nearly as good as in previous tests. Subject balked at eating the dish, saying that it smells like but was persuaded to eat it. Subject ate approximately 40% of the meal before stating, I'm gonna be sick at which time subject vomited. Subject was instructed to finish the meal, but subject responded, data expunged. Termination of subject considered, but rejected, in favor of further testing. Analysis More evidence that SCP-241 can improve the cooking skill of its user. Subject 241-D retained for further testing. Test 241-4 Subject Subject 241-D Procedure SCP-241 was still open from test 241-3. Subject 241-D was instructed to not close SCP-241, find the sautéed scallops recipe, prepare it, and eat it, while giving feedback during the entire process. Results Subject vociferously protested to having to eat her own cooking, but was persuaded to cooperate with the promise that subject would not have to eat the resultant dish. If it turned out like in the previous test, subject expressed skepticism, but proceeded to prepare the sautéed scallops recipe. While cooking the dish, subject experienced none of the difficulties she experienced from the previous test, instead expressing the now familiar surprise that her cooking was turning out so well. The completed dish looked and smelled similar to the results of test 241-2. The subject was not nearly as reluctant to eat the prepared dish declaring it not bad, not bad at all. Subject did not appear to suffer from any adverse effects after eating the dish. During post-testing interviews, subject was asked how she was able to prepare the sautéed scallops during this test, when the results of the previous test were so unappetizing. Subject stated that she did not know, only that once she started cooking the dish, it became perfectly clear to her how to do it. Subject did not appear to have any additional knowledge of cooking, and even had trouble remembering the cooking techniques she used in this test. Analysis There is now little doubt that SCP-241 can turn people who know nothing about cooking into gourmet chefs, at least for the dish that's being prepared. Test 241-11 Subject Subjects 241-E and 241-F were chosen from general population. Subject 241E is known to have an allergy to peanuts. Subject 241F has demonstrated considerable skill as a chef. Procedure Subject 241E was presented with SCP-241 while closed and instructed to open it and choose a recipe. Subject 241F was then instructed to prepare the selected meal from SCP-241. The prepared dish was given to Subject 241E, who was then asked to eat it. Results Subject 241E opened SCP-241 and, while looking through the recipes offered, 
stated that all the recipes called for peanuts, adding, peanuts mess me up something fierce. Subject found a few recipes that did not include peanuts, and selected an Australian carrot cake. Subject 241F prepared the carrot cake from SCP-241 and remarked that the finished product was better than he expected. The cake was presented to Subject 241E, who started eating without prompting or hesitation. Subject stated that the cake was the best thing I've ever eaten and ate nearly half the cake before claiming satiation. Within two minutes, Subject started showing symptoms of anaphylactic shock. Subject was administered epinephrine, which was ineffective, and died four minutes later. Autopsy confirmed anaphylactic shock as the cause of death. The recipes in SCP-241 were examined, and 85 of the 99 recipes called for peanuts or peanut products, but the Australian carrot cake was not one of them. The carrot cake and seven other recipes included lupin flour. A quick search found that lupin flour can induce an anaphylactic reaction in those who suffer from peanut allergies. The remaining six recipes called for more… exotic ingredients. SCP-241 remained open. The remaining half of the cake was saved for further testing. Analysis Reactions of subjects 241E and 241F were both consistent with prior observations. The selection of recipes supports the theory that SCP-241 somehow determines the substance that the target is most allergic to and offers recipes to specifically induce a fatal allergic reaction in the target. Test 241-12 Subject Subject 241F Procedure Subject 241F was instructed to prepare the six dishes that contain neither peanuts nor lupin flour. The dishes were turned over for analysis. The six recipes were transcribed. Results Data expunged Analysis Data expunged Subject 241F showed no apparent ill effects from preparing seven different dishes from SCP-241 in quick succession. Recommended retaining subject to study long-term effects of secondary, i.e. not as the target, exposure to SCP-241. Test 241-13 Subject Subject 241G was chosen from general population and is known to have an allergy to peanuts. Procedure Subject was instructed to eat the remaining cake from Test 241-11. Results Subject asked if the cake contained peanuts, and was assured that it did not. Subject stated that he didn't much like carrot cake. Subject started eating the cake, remarking that the cake was pretty good actually. Subject consumed approximately 75% of the remaining cake before declaring satiation. After seven minutes, subject started showing signs of anaphylactic shock. Epinephrine was administered, and subject was stabilized. Subject eventually recovered, although recovery time was somewhat longer than expected. Analysis It appears that, although the recipes from SCP-241 are potentially hazardous to anyone susceptible to the allergen in question, SCP-241's recipes are most potent against the target. Test 241-14 Subject Subject 241H was chosen from general population. According to complete health screenings, Subject has no food allergies. Procedure Subject was instructed to open SCP-241 and leave it open for analysis. Results Analysis of SCP-241 showed that 79 of the recipes on its pages called for chicken eggs or egg-based products. 15 of the remaining recipes called for eggs. The other five recipes data expunged. These five recipes were transcribed. Subject 241H stated that she had never experienced any problems eating eggs before. Subject was presented with one dozen hard-boiled chicken eggs and was instructed to eat them. Subject asked for salt and pepper, granted, and proceeded to eat the eggs. While eating the third egg, subject started complaining of stomach pain. Subject was instructed to continue eating, and she begrudgingly continued. Upon ingesting her seventh egg, subject collapsed on the floor, doubled over in pain. Within 60 seconds, subject started showing signs of anaphylactic shock. Epinephrine was administered, and subject was stabilized. Subject recovered, 
within the expected recovery time for such an episode. Analysis We now have evidence that SCP-241 somehow induces or amplifies an allergy in the target when SCP-241 is opened. This ability would explain how SCP-241 is able to cause an allergic reaction in targets without pre-existing food allergies. Addendum 3 Notes from Cross-Testing To determine the effects of SCP-241's recipes on subjects that either cannot eat or do not require sustenance, approval was given to cross-test SCP-241 on SCP-1770. Upon subject opening the book, the contents were identical to before it was closed previously. This confirms results of Test 241-23 in which SCP-241 does not respond to inorganic subjects. Item Number SCP-284 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-2841 and SCP-2842 are to be kept under minimal security protocols, with occasional off-site trips when approved by a Level 4 or higher personnel. During these trips, they are to be accompanied by a minimum of one Level 1 researcher and one Level 1 field agent. Their quarters are a standard humanoid containment room with two beds. When offered separate containment quarters, they replied that privacy is moot. Description: SCP-2841 and SCP-2842 are twins, born on date undisclosed, in Illinois. Though they appear to be normal, they are dizygotic twins who share a single functional brain. SCP-2841 is female, 1.72 meters tall, containing the left side of the brain. SCP-2842 is male, 1.79 meters tall, containing the right side of the brain. The portions that are not associated with either lobe are data expunged. In both subjects, the size of the possessed lobe is approximately 50% larger than normal presumably to allow for maintaining function of two bodies at once. It has been found that while the subjects have separate personalities, they share memories, skills, knowledge, physical sensation, and have shown limited levels of emotional synergy. Though there is no way to know for certain, they claim to have taught themselves how to block out sensory information from each other to varying degrees. Vision and hearing can be blocked out completely, while taste, smell, and touch can be weakened. Doing so is a choice of the one receiving the information, not the one experiencing it. With physical skills, it should be noted that while both subjects have the knowledge of proper technique, muscle tissue only develops to properly execute the skills efficiently, and with significant endurance in the subject who physically learned the skill. While the subjects do not show any advantage in proficiency for skills associated with their respective lobes, it has been found that when separated by a significant distance, they each have delayed responses from the other subject's lobe. Also of note is that both subjects seem incapable of remaining awake more than 16 minutes after the other has fallen asleep, and both awaken at the same time whether allowed to sleep until they wake up on their own or woken from their sleep separately. Addendum 2841 Test Log 2841 SCP-2841 and SCP-2842 were placed at separate ends of the facility. A team of researchers, including two surgeons, removed the top of SCP-2842's cranium and proceeded to apply an electrode to various points on the brain to gauge reactions to the stimuli. In all instances, SCP-2841 experiences the same sensation or physical reaction as SCP-2842. Addendum 2842 Researcher Note Today it was noted that while SCP-2841 was playing the piano in Dr. P***'s office, SCP-2842's fingers began twitching erratically. When brought to Dr. P***'s office, it was discovered that the twitching of SCP-2842's fingers were in time with the motions of SCP-2841's fingers as she played. Further study of this phenomenon is being scheduled. Item Number SCP-337 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-337 is to be kept within a steel-reinforced 0.5 meter thick, polished cement containment chamber at all times. Chamber walls must be inspected weekly for cracks and resealed as needed. 
Access will only be available via two-stage vaulted steel door system with a seal tolerance not to exceed 100 micrometers. Antechamber between the doors is to be fitted with multiple remote-operated liquid propellant flamethrowers. Both chambers are to be externally monitored with wireless security cameras. Damage or repositioning of cameras should be reported immediately. A self-contained water recycling shower system will be positioned at the far end of the internal chamber. The system's water supply and filters are to be changed on a monthly basis. Personnel assigned to SCP-337 must maintain all head and body hair at no longer than 4 centimeters, and will submit to regular full-body inspection to ensure compliance. Any personnel entering the chamber must be escorted by two guards, armed with portable flamethrowers. Following Incident 337-A, Class D personnel involved in testing must be strapped into a restraining gurney and sedated prior to entry. Once per week, one Class D personnel will be stripped of hair measuring longer than 5 centimeters using the Solomon technique. An attendant must immediately deliver the hair into the chamber and permit the object to feed. During this time, the attendant will sweep the floor clean of shedding using a standard broom and dustpan. Following Incident 337-C, vacuum cleaners are not permitted for use within 15 meters of SCP-337 containment, unless specifically authorized. Description SCP-337 is a large conglomeration of human hair, weighing approximately 60 kilograms at last measure. The object's shape and dimensions are tremendously variable. SCP-337 is fully animate, capable of a wide range of locomotion, and can exert force in excess of 18 kilonewtons. It also seems to possess some low level of sentience, although attempts at communication have thus far met with limited success. The object is able to manipulate any hair directly connected to its central mass, with precision down to the individual strand. The method by which SCP-337 mobilizes its components is still under investigation. Analysis of filaments attached to the object has shown them to be identical to regular human hair, and strands that are periodically shed from the object are similarly normal, aside from being drained of pigmentation. Filaments display typical tensile strength and can be easily damaged by fire, blades, or consumer-grade chemical clog remover. Although it displays no obvious sensory organs, SCP-337 is highly aware of its surroundings and may even possess perceptive abilities exceeding those of humans. For the most part, these senses are tuned towards detecting and acquiring its principal form of sustenance, fresh human hair. When a human being with any hair measuring longer than 5 centimeters comes within approximately 30 meters of SCP-337, it enters what could be described as a predatory state, rapidly braiding together several dense tendrils of hair in the direction of its prey. The object's range of perception seems to be unhindered by the walls of its containment chamber. The object will then close in on its target at great speed, attempting to overtake and envelop it. When successful, SCP-337 restrains the subject's limbs and begins to harvest all hair of sufficient length from the body. Hair is painlessly removed from the dermis at the base, root included, and is immediately incorporated into the object's mass via knotting or weaving. Patterns of bruising, bleeding, and sebaceous eruption on subjects following feedings suggest follicles are partially loosened from the inner sheath prior to extraction. This appears to sometimes accelerate hair regrowth, even in regions where it is typically stunted. To date, researchers have failed to replicate this effect artificially. While SCP-337 was found in a filthy state at time of recovery, it has since demonstrated a preference for cleanliness. Not long after initial containment, the object managed to escape its temporary enclosure through a narrow, 2 centimeters in diameter, wiring duct. It was discovered on site several hours later in the fourth floor women's washroom, where it emerged from a drain and consumed the hair of two showering researchers. A security team arrived shortly thereafter to find SCP-337 under a running shower tap lathering itself with shampoo left behind by the women. Once containment was re-established, SCP-337's enclosure was fitted with its present bathing accommodations, 
and a supply of hair conditioning product. The object's rate of shedding has since decreased dramatically. Note, SCP-337 may seem to prefer live feedings, but it will still readily consume hair that has already been removed from a human host, provided the follicle is intact and the root has only been detached for a few minutes. We have established a means of accomplishing this extraction just as effectively, if not as painlessly, as the object's method. To limit risk of cross-contamination, Class D personnel should only be exposed to SCP-337 for approved testing purposes. Requests by personnel to be deliberately exposed for feeding are preemptively denied. Dr. Addendum SCP-337 has demonstrated the ability to grow well beyond its present mass through the accumulation of additional hair. It was discovered in the plumbing system of a large nursing home facility in Pennsylvania in 19 after Agent noticed a story entitled Sewer Snakes Scalp Senior Citizens in a local newspaper. A team was dispatched to investigate under the guise of a fumigation contracting company. After evacuating residents to another facility, agents cut off all water and sewage lines in the building, monitoring sink and shower drains for any sign of the object. When a portion of SCP-337 finally emerged, it attempted to couple with Agent R's cranium, only to be intercepted by his weapon's bayonet. The tendril immediately retracted into the drain, after which time the object was not sighted again for more than 45 minutes. Coordinated deployment of chemical clog remover forced the object to exit through pipes in the facility's basement-level utility room, where several agents were on hand to apprehend it with portable flamethrowers. However, the agents were unprepared for the sheer size of the object, which quickly filled the lower level of the building. In the confusion, a sizable portion of SCP-337 was ignited. The resulting blaze spread quickly throughout the facility. Most on the upper floors were able to flee the structure before it collapsed, but several agents did not escape in time. SCP-337 managed to extricate its remaining mass through the building's ventilation system, shedding burning components as it went. When it finally amassed in the facility's parking lot, it was estimated to be over meters tall. Surviving members of the intervention team converged around the object and successfully corralled it within the lot using flame propellant until support arrived. By the time SCP-337 was contained, it had lost more than 90% of its original mass. The fire and subsequent destruction of the nursing home was officially blamed on faulty wiring, and damages were settled out of court. Displaced residents were transferred to a foundation-operated nursing facility, where amnesiacs were administered as required and data expunged without incident. Incident 337-A Personnel involved Dr. Solomon, D-28803 Date, undisclosed. Description, 10.26 a.m. Dr. Solomon and two guards enter antechamber of SCP-337 containment area, escorting D-28803 for scheduled testing. D-28803's hands and ankles are cuffed. He is moderately uncooperative, pleading not to be taken into the chamber. Rumors of a haircut monster are widespread among Class D personnel on site. 10.27 AM Dr. Solomon assures D-28803 that he is completely safe. She firmly reminds him that his cooperation is beneficial to them both. 10.29 AM All personnel enter inner chamber. SCP-337 has already extended several tendrils in direction of D-28803. D-28803 shouts multiple expletives, attempts to move toward exit, is restrained. 10.30 AM SCP-337 closes in on D-28803. D-28803 produces a small pair of shears that had previously been hidden in his waistband. D-28803, still cuffed, rests free from guards, and lunges at SCP-337, screaming. 10.30 AM D-28803 thrusts shears into SCP-337, managing to sever one of the object's tendrils. SCP-337 recoils as if in pain. 10.30 AM 
SCP-337 envelops D-28803. Dr. Solomon shouts something unintelligible to guards. A muffled cry is heard, followed by a wet-sounding thump. 10.31 AM. Guards engage pilot lights of flamethrowers. SCP-337 retreats, disentangling itself from its host. D-28803 collapses to the ground. Body is hairless. Shears are buried up to the handle in the center of D-28803's forehead. Dense hair later discovered in nostrils, trachea, lungs. 10.32 AM. Personnel exit containment chamber with corpse. Incident 337B. Personnel involved. Dr. Here and referred to as Dr. R. Date. Undisclosed. Description. 4.57 PM. Dr. R and two guards enter antechamber of SCP-337 containment area. No D-class personnel are present. Object has refused feeding for two consecutive weeks. SCP-337's former handler, Dr. Solomon, was killed one month prior in an unrelated incident. 4.58 PM. All personnel enter inner chamber. SCP-337 is spread out in a loose pile in center of room, braiding and unbraiding three tendrils. Dr. R approaches object. 4.59 PM. Dr. R extends a large bottle of herbal shampoo toward SCP-337. SCP-337 stops braiding and retracts tendrils into itself. 5 PM. A thick bulb-shaped extrusion of hair emerges at a 45-degree angle from the top of SCP-337. Hair contorts and intertwines on the bulb until detail begins to emerge. 5.01 PM. Dr. R drops the bottle. SCP-337 has produced a crude but recognizable likeness of the late Dr. Solomon. 5.01 PM. Dr. R stumbles back from the object. Both guards rush to support him. SCP-337 turns to follow Dr. R, so that the head formation continues to face him. 5.02 PM. The researcher appears severely distraught. She's gone, okay? She's gone! 5.02 PM. Guards attempt to usher Dr. R to the exit. R grabs the handle portion of a guard's flamethrower and directs it at SCP-337. 5.02 PM. Nearest guard punches Dr. R in the jaw. He crumples. Guards restrain the researcher and drag him to the exit. SCP-337 remains still, continuing to direct the head formation toward R. 5.03 PM. All personnel exit containment chamber. The head retracts back into SCP-337, dissolving again into shapeless hair. After a moment, it retrieves the shampoo bottle from the floor and begins to lather itself. Note: This incident is troublesome for a number of reasons. There is no indication that Dr. R was in any way psychically affected by SCP-337, as some have proposed. The man had recently lost a close colleague, and psychiatric analysis after the incident revealed he was much more bereaved about it than he let on. Nevertheless, his reaction to the object's behavior seems illogically severe. It also squandered our first, and so far only, opportunity to engage in communication with the object. We are fortunate that SCP-337 returned to its former behavior patterns not long after the incident. For now, personnel assigned to SCP-337 should undergo periodic psychological evaluation until we know more. I also recommend rotating handlers for the object on a regular basis so that no one becomes too attached. Dr. B Item number SCP-343 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-343 resides in a 6.1 meter by 6.1 meter or 20 feet by 20 feet room at Minimal Security Site 17. It should be brought any items it requests and visited by at least one staff member each day. Attempts to add further safety precautions or required clearances are unnecessary or impossible 
due to the nature of SCP-343. Description SCP-343 is a male, seemingly raceless, humanoid in appearance with apparent omnipotence. SCP-343 was discovered walking the streets of Prague and detained after a staff member witnessed him disappear from the streets and reappear on a rooftop. SCP-343 is detained willingly in his chamber, as containment has proved impossible. Addendum number 3431 SCP-343, colloquially nicknamed God by the staff here, looks like an older man, although his features are different to each observer. In my first talk with him, he claimed outright to be the creator of the universe. When I asked him to prove this, he laughed, walked through the wall of the chamber, and returned seconds later with a hamburger in his hand. When I returned for a second visit, the previously bare cell had been furnished in upscale Old English style, complete with a roaring fireplace, and seemed many times larger than it did from the exterior. SCP-343 greatly enjoys speaking with people, and seems to have a knowledge of all topics. Visiting with SCP-343 has become a daily event for many of the staff here, and all employees report feeling generally happier after each visit. Attempts to bar staff below level 3 clearance have proven unsuccessful, as guards assigned to watch the room quit their posts, saying, you know he likes company, or shrugging when questioned. Since SCP-343 has thus far been harmless, all staff have been allowed access, and somehow they all have time to meet with him for as long as they need. For now, I leave this report open as further questioning of SCP-343 is ongoing. Dr. Beck Warning, security level 4 or higher needed for further access. Addendum number 3432 In regards to document 3431A, there are no relevant records available, or seemingly in existence. And, similarly, all records of Dr. ever working with SCP-343 or Dr. Beck are missing and presumed non-existent. All staff questioned about the document convey ignorance of document number 3431A and claim not to have met Dr. In a related matter, Senior Officer Dr. Beck has requested a higher staff rotation to increase morale in worse-off sections. This is a very odd request and was the subject of further investigation. Other localized anomalies, such as better health, greater job satisfaction, and lower fatalities in this section have led to the request being granted. This subject is now closed, on orders of 05 Addendum number 3433 Data recovered from routine check of Dr. R's network drive. Document number 3431A Data lost. As of data expunged, visitors of SCP-343 are to be questioned as to their intent in converse Data lost. Questions pertaining to other SCP are to be put forth. Data lost. Orders of Dr. Document number 3431B. Data lost. Apparently my orders have gone missing. This is the last straw, Dr. B. Data lost. All my reports and requests to higher-ups have gone unnoticed. I will confront SCP-343 tomorrow. Signed, Dr. Item Number SCP-348 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-348 is to be kept in a standard locker at Site-19. Personnel wishing to conduct tests involving SCP-348 are to obtain Level 3 or higher authorization and present a detailed list of intended test subjects. Description SCP-348 is a white ceramic bowl, patterned with light blue flowers, measuring approximately 20 centimeters in diameter and 9 centimeters high. While no maker's marks are present, the Chinese characters for Thinking of You are etched into the side of the bowl. When in the presence of an individual afflicted with a minor ailment or injury, i.e. mild cough, runny nose, or scrapes, SCP-348 will fill with soup. While the ingredients present within the soups produced by SCP-348 vary, young subjects, individuals between the ages of 4 and 18, have consistently stated that they enjoyed the meal, sometimes stating that it reminds them of their parents' cooking. 
Subjects will finish the soup found in SCP-348 if allowed. Children who eat from SCP-348 several times often express a feeling of contentment, stating that though they are eating by themselves, they do not feel lonely. Addendum SCP-3481 SCP-348 was acquired shortly after rumors of a child living in apparently possessing remarkable recovery abilities came to the Foundation's attention. Investigation revealed that the child in question originally discovered SCP-348 in the attic of their house and had come to rely on it after receiving insufficient attention from their parents. The child's parents, both full-time workers, refused to comment on their relationship with the child. Resulting testing involving children was carried out under the guise of surveys to gauge the success of new food items offered at public schools. Addendum SCP-3482 It has been noted that, occasionally, after soup produced by SCP-348 has been consumed, a message will materialize on the inside of the bowl. Words produced on the inside of the bowl appear to be printed on the ceramic consistent with existing markings. The message that appears will be in the language most familiar to the drinker of the soup. After several hours, or when SCP-348 produces another meal, the words disappear. Testing Log SCP-3481323 Subject 8-year-old female, afflicted with sore throat. Brief background Lives with and is on good terms with both parents. Notes Subject took approximately 30 minutes to consume soup. Remarked later that sore throat seemed to have gone away. Subject 10-year-old male, recently injured self while biking. Minor bruising. Brief background. Lives with both parents. Often argues with both. Notes. Message appeared. Don't forget to brush. Subject. 11-year-old male. Afflicted with slight cold. Brief background. Lives with foster parents. Notes. Message appeared. I'm glad you're happy. Subject. 9-year-old female. Afflicted with slight cold. Brief background. Lives with both parents. Said to be prone to tantrums. Notes. Nothing of note occurred during or immediately after testing. Subject stated while she didn't particularly care for the soup after tasting it, she still wanted to eat it. Follow-up investigations revealed that the subject recovered from the cold faster than was expected. Subject. Six-year-old male. Recently injured self while playing with friends. Minor scrapes and scratches. Brief background. Parents divorced. Currently lives with mother. Notes. Message appeared. I'm sorry, son. Subject. Seven-year-old female. Afflicted with cough. Brief background. Lives with mother and grandmother. Father deceased. Traffic accident. Notes. Message appeared. I love you. Addendum. SCP-3483. Testing has revealed that in the event that someone older than 18 years of age attempts to consume soup created by SCP-348, the individual will find that they are less inclined to finish the meal. Some such individuals will remark that something is missing. Most will simply state that the soup was nothing out of the ordinary. Further studies carried out with older subjects indicate that though messages will appear for individuals older than 18, the appearance of the messages is worn and faded. Testing Log SCP-3482635 Note It was observed that though over 100 subjects were tested, only four individuals received messages from SCP-348. Subject 30-year-old female, afflicted with headache. Brief background On poor terms with both parents. Refused to accept father's offer for career training. Currently lives alone. Notes Message appeared why? Subject. 35-year-old male. Afflicted with cough. Brief background. Parents divorced. Visits father and stepmother once a month. Does not visit mother on her insistence. Notes. Message appeared. It'll get better. Subject. 40-year-old female. Afflicted with sore throat. Brief background. Moved away and became estranged from both parents. Nevertheless, sent money and took care of senior housing for both. Father recently passed away. Notes. 
Subject noted the soup tasted initially bitter, but was fulfilling in the end. Message appeared. Thank you. Subject. 40-year-old male, afflicted with minor backaches. Brief background. Murdered father approximately one year ago. Notes. Subject tasted and then refused to consume soup, complaining about the taste. Subject later developed mild stomach pains. After the contents of SCP-348 were disposed of, SCP-348 immediately filled with what appeared to be salt water, which remained for three hours before disappearing. Subject, 45-year-old male, afflicted with aches due to arthritis. Brief background, happily married, lives with wife and children, visits father once a week with family, mother deceased. Notes, message appeared. I'm proud of you. Despite the extensive data gathered in testing, it is unknown whether the messages that SCP-348 has manifested originate from the fathers of the subjects or SCP-348 itself. Addendum SCP-3484 SCP-348 was once used in a test involving a 60-year-old man suffering from a terminal illness. The subject, a grandfather with multiple grandchildren, stated that the soup produced by SCP-348 was the best he'd ever tasted. Following the test, the subject reported feeling a sense of satisfaction and noted that the pain caused by the illness seemed to have faded. The subject passed away peacefully a week later. Item Number SCP-372 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-372 is to be contained in a cell, 5 meters by 4 meters by 2 meters, lined with reinforced plexiglass. Embedded into each of the four walls of this cell will be one infrared motion detector. Feeding will take place once every two weeks, to consist of one kilogram of red meat and uncooked vegetables, to be deposited in its cell via chute. All guards working near SCP-372 cell must wear helmets with cameras mounted in the forehead, with live feeds to the nearest guard station. In the event of a containment breach, an alert will be sounded that all personnel should watch for any brief flickering movements in the corner of their eyes, and to report immediately if one is sighted. Description: SCP-372 is a creature of unknown genus, approximately 2 meters long from head to tail and weighing approximately 45 kilograms. It has a long, thin body with eight pairs of narrow limbs. Analysis has shown that its muscle fibers are allowing for extremely fast and precise movements. Every part of the body is abnormally flexible, and the limbs are coated with small fibers that cling to almost any solid surface. In place of eyes or ears, it has data expunged. This sensory organ is capable not only of echolocation, but also of detecting energy transfers, such as the electrical impulses in the brains of nearby beings. SCP-372 has learned to time its movements to those pulses, predicting the movements of any being around it. It uses this technique to hide, either by hiding behind the head of a person looking for it, or by hiding in their scotomas, blind spots, and saccades clipping during eye movement. SCP-372 first came to the attention of the Foundation on Date Expunged, when an undercover agent working at Location Expunged reported seeing a creature that resembled the described hallucinations of one of the patients. After thorough investigation, SCP-372 was captured via and it was determined that it had, for unknown reasons, been tormenting the unfortunate patient. It had confused him by periodically following him and remaining within sight of him while hiding outside the visual fields of those around him, making him believe that he was hallucinating a monster no one else could see. Unfortunately, the patient had by this time actually become mentally unbalanced due to stress and data expunged. Log of Tests on SCP-372 Participants 2D-Class Personnel Location, empty room, 6 meters by 5 meters by 3 meters. Test parameters, D1 was instructed to stand in the middle of the room, D2 in the corner. Both were to perform a visual search of the room. 
SCP-372 was released into the testing room. After five minutes, armed personnel entered and ushered SCP-372 back into its holding cell, and D-1 and D-2 were debriefed. Results After five minutes, D-1 reported no sighting, and D-2 only detected a few brief flashes. Participants 2 D-Class Personnel Location Empty Room 6 meters by 5 meters by 3 meters Test Parameters D1 and D2 were instructed to stand in opposite corners of the room and make a visual inspection of the room once SCP-372 was released into the containment room. Results After 5 minutes, both D-Class had sighted SCP-372 15 times, both at identical times. It is believed that SCP-372 was darting around in the spots where the blind spots in their vision overlapped, and occasionally had to break cover and dart into another one when one area was no longer overlapping. Participants 4 D-Class Personnel Location Empty Room 6 meters by 5 meters by 3 meters Test Parameters D1, D2, D3, and D4 were instructed to stand in the four corners of the room and watch SCP-372. Results Approximately 1.5 seconds after SCP-372 was introduced into the testing area, D3 shrieked and collapsed, spurting blood from a wound on his that seemed to have spontaneously appeared. D1, D2, and D4 abandoned their stations and ran for the locked exit. D4 began pounding on the door before he was also injured, losing one D1 and 2 retreated into one corner, D1 curling up into the fetal position, while D2 stood absolutely still. No activity was reported for the remainder of the five-minute test. When the test was ended, D3 had expired. D4 required surgical and D1 and D2 were not physically harmed. None of the surviving test subjects reported seeing SCP-372 at any time. Notes Aside from what it did to that mental patient, this is the first time it's actively harmed a person. D3 didn't really have time to do anything that pissed it off either. Did it just get hungry? Dr. Addendum Anyone pranking nervous personnel by pretending to see SCP-372 in front of them will be severely reprimanded. 05 Item Number SCP-375 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The shopping mall where SCP-375 is located has been purchased by the Foundation and repurposed as Site-375, a site for the monitoring of SCP-375 and storage of safe class SCP objects. The main sign on the front face of SCP-375 is to remain concealed at all times. Test subjects are to be shown photographs during experimentation. Testing of SCP-375 is only to take place on D-Class personnel, who are exempt from monthly termination. In order to study the cumulative effects of SCP-375 exposure, Description SCP-375 is a former Wells Fargo bank, located in Casper, Wyoming. The signage on the building and front door has been anomalously modified to read Temporal Credit Union, while retaining the original Wells Fargo typeface. A series of 11 humanoid entities, designated SCP-375-A, remain present within the building at all times equipped in matching uniforms and claiming to be employees of SCP-375. SCP-375's anomalous properties manifest when any subject views its main sign and or interacts with the SCP-375-A instances inside the building. During Phase 1 of SCP-375 infection, subjects will feel compelled to exchange items of personal sentimental value via deposit and withdrawal. Between 12 to 24 hours after a deposit has been made, the deposited item will be replaced with an extra universal object, designated SCP-375-B, that is superficially similar to the original, but apparently from one of many alternate realities. Examples of items that have been retrieved from Phase 1 tests are provided in the table below.
Phase 1 Experimental Data Subject D34924 Item Deposited Autographed Trading Card of Major League Baseball Player Albert Pujols SCP-375-B Instance Autographed Trading Card of Albert Pujols for the North American Baseball League Pujols is listed as having played for the Seattle Pilots from 2001 to 2010 and the St. Louis Browns from 2011 to 2022. Subject D30246 Item Deposited Pennies Produced by SCP-1015 Subject was an SCP-10152 instance. SCP-375-B instance. 1974 United States Nichols. Close examination of the Nichols revealed they do not match coins produced by the United States Treasury in the 1970s and depict Harriet Tubman in place of Thomas Jefferson. SCP-1015's effects seem to cease while subject is inside the bank. Upon leaving, subject's anomalous properties are altered so that Nichols identical to those acquired within SCP-375 are produced in place of the previous pennies. Subject D-99411 Item Deposited 2009 School Yearbook from Sandalwood High School in Jacksonville, Florida, United States SCP-375-B Instance 2009 School Yearbook from Revolution High School in Harkinsville, Florida, People's Republic of America Yearbook editorials focus on the eternal struggle against capitalism, the importance of accepting Cuban refugees from the reactionary Havana regime, and miscellaneous local developments. Subject Item deposited SCP-375-B instance Subject D-12539 Item deposited Autographed copy of the autobiography Under a Cruel Star by Hida Margolius Kovali SCP-375-B Instance Autographed copy of the autobiography Fortress Prague by Hida Margolius Kovali Narrative recounts the author's life in fascist-ruled Europe, beginning with the March 1939 invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Greater German Reich and ending with the Allied liberation of the continent in 1951. The author frequently expresses guilt for doing nothing to prevent the deportation and extermination of her friends and neighbors. A note has been added to the author's signature which reads, To D12539, may Europe rise from the ashes. Approximately 80% of affected subjects will not progress past Phase 1 and will continue to use SCP-375 to exchange their possessions indefinitely. However, 20% of affected subjects will experience Phase 2 of infection within six months of initial exposure. After this phase begins, SCP-375-A instances will begin asking about participating in the Temporal Exchange Program. Consent to participate will invariably be given by all affected subjects by the third time SCP-375-A instances ask about the program. Once subjects agree, they will follow instances to the employee section of SCP-375 and enter the building's bank vault. 12 to 24 hours after their disappearance, a humanoid with physical characteristics identical or near identical to that of the previous subject will exit from the bank. These humanoids designated SCP-375-C, also appear to come from alternate realities and are often wearing dramatically different attire than the original test subject. Examples of humanoids that have been retrieved from Phase 2 tests are provided in the table below. Phase 2 Experimental Data SCP-375-C Instance D-99411 Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Non-standard foundation lab coat Information obtained from SCP-375-C Instance claimed to be a researcher at the non-existent Site-13 and described a reality in which the Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition worked together to utilize and or destroy anomalous phenomena. Instance is apparently non-anomalous and was assigned to a humanoid containment wing at a nearby site, pending possible Foundation employment. SCP-375-C Instance D-40013 Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Civilian clothing 
Information obtained from SCP-375-C. Instance appeared to be heavily intoxicated and was determined to be under the influence of several anomalous drugs. When asked for the date, Instance claimed it was Liberary 32nd and expressed irritation at the Foundation for interrupting its participation in a hedonistic festival. If accurate, this marks the first known occurrence of a subject being successfully removed from an SCP-3455 event in progress. SCP-375-C Instance D-34289 Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Civilian clothing Circa 1920s Information obtained from SCP-375-C Instance displayed anomalous monochromacy with its clothing and skin appearing as black and white in a manner similar to a vintage photograph. Instance remained highly distressed and loudly vocalized in pain for five minutes before its eyes appeared to transform into large anomalous white orbs and removed themselves from its body. Instance expired 15 minutes later while repeatedly expressing dismay at losing contact with the beautiful blue. SCP-375-C Instance Junior Researcher Olafsson Equivalent Clothing worn upon retrieval Non-standard Foundation Field Uniform Information obtained from SCP-375-C See Addendum 375-A Addendum 375-A In July 2018, it was discovered that Junior Researcher Olafsson a researcher assigned to SCP-375 had been using SCP-375 on himself without authorization from his superiors. After this activity was uncovered and disciplinary action had been taken, close analysis of SCP-375-B instances produced by Olafson's tests concluded that he had likely exchanged SCP object documentation with the SCP-375-A instances. Upon interrogation, Olafson admitted this was true and said each copy submitted was a printed documentation of an SCP object, which had properties or containment procedures that personally interested him, thus fulfilling SCP-375's item criteria. Several SCP-375-B instances produced by junior researcher Olafsson are summarized below. Original SCP Documentation SCP-173, a hostile Euclid-class anomalous sculpture that is incapable of moving when observed. Retrieved Documentation Phenom Number 173 A publicly displayed anomalous art sculpture that changes its appearance when left unobserved for one second every 24 hours. Original SCP Documentation SCP-4839 A Euclid-class info hazard that causes Foundation employees to believe select non-anomalous items must be contained. Retrieved Documentation SCP-4839 an Apollyon class info hazard that caused the Foundation to destroy human civilization in an attempt to contain every object in existence. Original SCP Documentation SCP-375 Baseline Documentation Retrieved Documentation SCP-375 An anomalous bank which compels subjects to deposit items into it and eventually themselves and their family members. Subjects' body parts are then withdrawn in various states of dismemberment, referred to as compound interest. The altered SCP-375 documentation was recovered after an SCP-375-C instance, similar in appearance to junior researcher Olafsson, emerged from SCP-375 unprompted. This marked the first known spontaneous manifestation of an SCP-375-C instance without an equivalent Temporal Exchange Item Number SCP-378 Object Class Thaumiel Notice from the Foundation Records and Information Security Administration Following the implementation of the Kraken Protocol on 2706-1963, containment procedures for SCP-378 have been updated. Personnel assigned to the SCP-378 project are to review its updated documentation as soon as possible. Claudia Southey, Director, RISA. Special Containment Procedures SCP-378 is to be contained in a subterranean entity containment terrarium. 
temperature and humidity are to be maintained at levels optimal for the growth and habitation of Heterodermia cane crow, Utica cave lichen, and Prenolepis everettman, North American cave ant. Twice per year, SCP-378 is to undergo a medical and psychological examination. Access to SCP-378's containment terrarium is separated from the surrounding facility by a decontamination chamber. Handling personnel are required to wear full body protection and must be screened for SCP-378-A prior to exiting decontamination. Infected personnel are to be terminated unless the position of SCP-3781 or 3 is vacant, in which case they are to be assigned to the relevant position instead. As of the adoption of the Kraken Protocol, SCP-378's containment is focused on maintaining its three primary containment components. SCP-3781 is housed in the Area 19 barracks. SCP-3781 is employed as a maintenance technician with a security clearance of O-A19. Upon the death of the current SCP-3781, brain-dead or comatose reserve personnel may be elected to replace it. As SCP-3781 is the primary means of communication with SCP-378, care must be maintained to keep SCP-3781's vocal functions in working order. SCP-3782 currently takes the form of David Lockheed, a 36-year-old Caucasian male and the employee of the American Supernatural Containment Initiative, ASCII, as a clerical aide, to maintain the continued operations of the SCP Foundation in the United States. SCP-3782 has been tasked with sabotaging ASCII operations against the Foundation, as well as collecting information in the Foundation's interests. SCP-3782 is expected to follow a strict health and exercise regimen due to the inherent difficulty in replacing it. SCP-3783 currently takes the form of Lisa Martin, a 33-year-old Mexican-American female employee at the Spicy Crust Pizza in Staten Island. In the event of SCP-3783's death, it must be replaced as soon as possible. Each component is fitted with a tracking device and an audio recorder. Each week, embedded agents stationed near each component are to evaluate the health and integrity of each component and its associated surveillance equipment. The utilization of SCP-378-A in further infiltration is pending Foundation Overwatch approval. Description SCP-378 is an arthropod, superficially resembling a deformed larval instance of Scolopendra gigantea, the Amazonian giant centipede. SCP-378's legs are largely vestigial, primarily meant to assist in peristaltic locomotion. SCP-378 measures 3 meters from mouth to anus, with a bodily thickness of 1 meter and a weight of 233 kilograms. Under normal conditions, SCP-378 is an omnivore, with a diet consisting primarily of lichen and insects. SCP-378 is capable of asexual reproduction at will, producing instances of SCP-378-A from its anus. Instances of SCP-378-A resemble adult Scolopendra gigantea. Dissection suggests this resemblance is superficial as SCP-378-A lack expected organ systems beyond a primitive neural network. Instances of SCP-378-A are controlled remotely by SCP-378. SCP-378-A are obligate endoparasites, infecting advanced primates such as humans, Homo ignotus, Data Expunged, and Gigantopithecus sapiens, common Sasquatch. Upon infection, SCP-378-A integrates itself with its host's nervous system through poorly understood means, inducing brain death and extending SCP-378's remote control to the host itself. Vital functions and sensory input remain unaffected. Upon infecting a suitable host, SCP-378 will attempt to reintegrate its hosts into their respective species' social sphere. Once integrated, SCP-378 directs its hosts to indefinitely engage in the behaviors typical for its species, such as communal labor and social recreation. Human hosts prefer environments with a high population density and a robust entertainment scene. The upper limit of active hosts SCP-378 can maintain at any one time is unknown. Upon initial interrogation, SCP-378 confessed to the existence of 26 human hosts, as well as two instances of Alouatta pigra, 
Guatemalan Black Howler, and three instances of SCP-1000, of which it noted had been acquired during a period of heavy intoxication. Addendum 178-294-B A Psychological Evaluation of SCP-378 Conducted by Dr. Simon Glass Tentatively designated Scolopendra Anomalia, SCP-378 is unique among arthropods, possessing either human levels of sapience or the ability to emulate its host's intellectual faculties. In any case, SCP-378 is self-aware and remarkably intelligent. SCP-378's relationship to its hosts is complicated. While SCP-378 maintains a consistent sense of identity across multiple hosts, each is treated as a persona for SCP-378 to roleplay. Hosts rarely interact with SCP-378 or fellow hosts, suggesting SCP-378 primarily utilizes its anomalous abilities for entertainment. This is further suggested by SCP-378's readiness to abandon such personas under duress. Aside from integration into human social spheres, host behavior is largely unique to each instance. Extroversion is relatively common. Hosts rarely isolate themselves except to sleep or excrete. SCP-378 appears to take equal enthusiasm in stressful versus pleasant situations. Of note, SCP-378 is particularly attached to the identity of Lisa Martin. In contrast to other hosts, Lisa Martin's weekly routine is relatively static. From 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will show up to work at the nearest pizzeria from the former location of Digian Antonio's Pies, regardless of employment status or scheduled hours. From 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. on all days except Saturday, Miss Martin will engage in the maintenance of one of 17 rooftop gardens across the city of New York. Of these, 13 are maintained by a cooperative, 12 of which Miss Martin is not a part of. From 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturdays, Miss Martin alternates between socializing with a collection of friends, co-workers, and lovers, and playing piano for various high-end bars. From 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., Miss Martin will shower and prepare for bed. Miss Martin will sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m., when she will wake up and prepare for the next cycle. In the event of Miss Martin's death, SCP-378 will direct another host to assume her identity. Attempts to interrupt Miss Martin's routine have been unilaterally met with unusual levels of hostility from SCP-378 and its hosts. From Assistant Director Daniela Hayden, Classification Level Rise of 4, Employee Number 134, to Director Kelsey Feinstein, Classification Level XK4, Employee Number 87, Regarding, 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 Identifying current hosts. Date 2704-1963. Director Feinstein. Mr. Song and Dr. Glass's work have revealed quite a bit about SCP-378. Most importantly, I do not believe it understands the significance of social dynamics, especially in regards to hierarchy and social capital. Several of SCP-378's identities held surprising positions of power. Indeed, Two of them, David Lockheed and Alfonso Liaz, are beyond reach of the Foundation's current capacity to contain. Despite this, SCP-378 has shown a willingness to sacrifice such hosts in order to defend, replace, or otherwise maintain Lisa Martin. Odd, yes, but useful enough. It'd be a shame if something were to happen to Miss Martin and her friends, would it not? SCP-378 is sapient but it by no means understands the significance of its actions. With a little bit of persuasion, David Lockheed might yet ascend from petty paper pusher for the ASCII, right where the Foundation most needs a puppet. And, if I'm not mistaken, spicy crust pizza can always do with a second franchise. Proposal Employing SCP-378's anomalous abilities to defend Foundation operations in the United States. Council Vote Summary Approved Proposal Accepted The Kraken Protocol has been initiated From Senior Researcher Sang Hun Song Classification Level Gamma U3 Employee Number 148 
2. Director Kelsey Feinstein. Classification level XK4. Employee number 87. Regarding delays in the Gamma U2677 project. Date 2107, 1965. So, good news and bad news, Director. Good news, as I'm assuming you already heard. With the plans for construction of Site 56, all thanks to a certain Mr. Lockheed, the Kraken Protocol is getting a much needed expansion. With its relative proximity to both the Lily of the Valley Nexus and the Pacific Northwest, it's a perfect opportunity to expand the scope of SCP-1000's containment, while ensuring the ASCII doesn't suck LOTV dry before we get to it. For all its oddities, SCP-378 appears to be delighted at the prospect of a change in scenery. I can't imagine a tropical centipede grub likes having a sphere of influence limited to New England of all places, but that's besides the point. Its A was compliant enough on the way there. Which leads me to the bad news. Rupert Tremont's a fun little guy. Agent of the FBI's unofficial, unusual incidents unit, and all too stupid to trust Agent Ryans with his drink while he went to the restroom. After that, it's a matter of transport back to Provisional Area 56 in Black Rock, and a centipede down the gullet. Problem comes up when 378 tells us it can't establish a connection. Now, Tremont's still alive, so that's not normal. We run a number of tests, try to figure out what went wrong. And that's when we see a different centipede in his head, where our centipede usually goes. More to come, but I have a bad feeling about this. Item number, SCP-393, Object Class, Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. SCP-393 is to be kept in the possession of a designated D-Class subject, hereby referred to as D-393. At sight, the vitals of D-393 are to be monitored at all times, to prevent SCP-393 from linking to important SCP personnel in the event of D-393's death. A secondary D-Class subject will remain on standby for emergency reclamations of SCP-393 if D-393 should die. Description SCP-393 is an ordinary 9cm by 14cm blue day planner, with a year embroidered into its cover that always matches the current year. The information on the back of the day planner reveals it to be a product of publishing. SCP-393 has the ability to link to a nearby subject via unknown means. Once linked, the day planner will appear in the hands of its owner whenever it is not being watched. Additionally, any event written in the past dates of the day planner are instantly recalled by the subject, as if they experienced it themselves. Events written in a future date of SCP-393 will elicit no change until the date of the event has passed, at which time the subject will recall the event. If the subject currently linked with SCP-393 dies, SCP-393 will choose a new owner within 10 minutes of the previous owner's demise, based on proximity. There appears to be no maximal distance for this ability. Experiment Log 393 All written input to SCP-393 is done by researcher assistant Test 3931 Subject one linked D-Class, male. Description. Subject instructed to do nothing of interest for the entire day of date expunged, and is monitored by closed circuit television. Written. Park date with the girlfriend today at 3 o'clock. Outcome. When subject is questioned about what he did the previous day, he responds, I went to the park with Cindy for a few hours. Review of the security tapes show that the subject did not leave the facility, and had a completely uneventful day, in accordance with witness testimonies from guards around the facility. Note. Well, at least this proves it doesn't change history, just the subject's memory of it. Additionally, SCP-393 seems to fill in details for the memory, such as for the girlfriend's name and the location of the park. More tests will have to be done to find its limits. Dr. Test 3932 Subject One linked D-Class 
Female. Description. New subject instructed to do nothing of note for the day of date expunged and is monitored by CCTV. Written event to be as brief as possible. Written. Dentist. 130. Outcome. When subject questioned in depth about her dentist appointment the other day, she gives a detailed report which includes the dentist's name and age. No doctor is found in local phone registry. The length of their weight, the sorts of magazines available in the waiting room and their contents, etc. The details recalled surpass the subject's natural memory, according to previous mental cognition tests. Test 3933 Subject One linked D-class Male Description New subject instructed to do nothing of note for the day of date expunged, as per previous tests, and under CCTV entire day. Written Getting hit by a bus today. Outcome The moment the event is recorded into the day planner, subject goes into a deep coma. Neuroimaging scans show no brain activity past basic bodily functions. SCP-393 links to standby D-class subject after 10 minutes. Note. Well, now we know what happens if you think you're dead. Dr. Test. 3934. Subject. One linked D-class. Male. Description. New subject instructed to do nothing of note for the day of date expunged, and is continually monitored by CCTV. Written. Going to somehow defeat SCP-682 today. Outcome. Outcome is identical to previous test, save for the frozen expression of horror on the comatose subject's face. SCP-393 links to standby D-class. Note. It was worth a shot. Research Assistant Test 3935 Subject One linked D-class Male Description Subject instructed to do nothing of interest for the entire day of date expunged and is monitored by closed circuit television. Written Going to favorite restaurant Outcome When interviewed about his day yesterday, Subject informed interviewers about his trip to the bar and grill, where he enjoyed ribs and beer on tap with several buddies. Subject is able to give names of his friends when questioned. Friends and the restaurant mentioned proved to be real from Subject's past, according to previous interview. Test 3935A Subject One linked D-class Male Amnesiac Description Subject instructed to do nothing of interest for the entire day of date expunged, and is monitored by closed-circuit television. Subject recalls nothing about his time outside of Foundation, due to previous medical condition. Written. Going to favorite restaurant. Outcome. When interviewed about his day, subject talks about going to the buffet, where he had Chinese food and tea with his girlfriend. Investigation into existence of said buffet proves it is not a real restaurant, along with the girlfriend he visited. Note: This proves that SCP-393 draws on the subject's existing memories, creating false ones where some are lacking. Dr. Test 3936 Subject One linked D-class Male Buddhist Description New subject instructed to do nothing of note for the day of date expunged, as per previous tests, and under CCTV entire day. Written, reaching Nirvana today. Outcome. After passage is written in 393, subject goes into meditative state, not responding to any outer stimuli. Neuroimaging scans show abnormal activity in the temporal lobe an area of the brain often responsible for religious visions. Subject expired of thirst after days of inaction. Interview Log 3931A Interviewed Test 3931 Subject Interviewer Dr. Forward Review of subject's mental state after Test 3931 
and the extent of memory alteration. Begin log. 531. Date expunged. Doctor. So you say you spent the day yesterday at park with your girlfriend Cindy. Is this correct? Subject 3931. Yeah, it was a pleasant afternoon. Doctor. How long would you say you have known Cindy? Subject 3931. I don't know. About two years? Doctor. Do you realize that you have been in this facility for a year now? And before that, you were in the state prison for a life sentence. Subject appears deep in thought, visibly worried. Subject 3931. But, oh, Cindy was my girlfriend from back in high school. I used all my conjugal visits to see her. Doctor. Hmm, I see. How exactly did you see your girlfriend yesterday? You haven't been let out of this facility for months. Subject appears distressed and begins to fidget nervously. Subject 3931. You guys gave me leave to see her. It was our two-year anniversary. Doctor. We don't give leave to any D-class at this facility, Subject 3931. I'm afraid that you never left the facility. Cindy does not exist. Subject is increasingly agitated and distraught. Subject 3931. But I know her. We were high school sweethearts. We've been together 10 years. It was our anniversary. Subject stands up. Doctor. Subject 3931, sit down now. Your stories are broken and make no sense. Cindy is not real. Play the tapes. Video logs of Subject 3931 for the previous day begin playing with timestamp. Subject 3931. Those are fake. You're lying to me. This is just another damn test. Subject picks up video projector and moves to smash it. Doctor. Sedate him. Guards tranquilize Subject 3931 and take the body to his holding cell. Doctor. Glad that's done with. Turn it off. We're done here. End log. Closing statement. Subject 3931 terminated after refusing to work and attacking any staff who entered his cell. SCP-393 has a heavy effect on the memory of the subject, but subject's memories fall apart under questioning. Dr. Item number. SCP-398. Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-398 is contained behind a reverse airlock-style containment chamber locking mechanism, consisting of at least three steel doors and an atmospheric reduction system. A minimum of two guards must be stationed at the doors, remaining at a 50-meter distance from the entrance to the SCP. Description SCP-398 appears to all subjects as a hallway of some description. However, details differ between accounts. It is first seen as a hallway with white walls, plain wooden doors 20 meters apart and approximately 2 meters high, and brass handles with no special attributes visible. This detail is consistent across all accounts. It was found on location at data expunged and upon investigation, a dimensional containment site was set up around it. The remainder of the original building surrounding it is unremarkable and has been demolished as such. Addendum 398A Agent sent to research subject, equipped with a handheld video camera with transmission feed. Said agent travels down the hall. Agent, the hall, it's changed. Transmission shows no change in the hall's appearance. Control. Changed. How so? Agent. It's different from when I walked in. Dark wood paneled walls. Red carpet. And Monet paintings. I like it. Control. Continue, Agent. Go in further. Agent. Roger, sir. Continuing. Agent continues until the appearance of several doors. The door is similar in design to others in the location. Control. Agent, open the one on the immediate right. Agent, 
Yes, sir. Agent opens the door to reveal an unpainted and unfurnished room. Agent, it seems to be a cafeteria. Control, a cafeteria? Is there anyone in it? Agent, you can't see it? There's no one in here, just tables, chairs, and a buffet-style layout. Smells real good, and I haven't had lunch yet. Control. Noted. Open the door opposite this room. Agent opens the door. It is identical to the first room in appearance. Agent. This one. It's a bedroom. Control. A bedroom. Agent. Yes, a child's room. The one I wanted from a catalog when I was a kid, because it had Spider-Man sheets. We couldn't afford it. Control. Noted. Continue. Open one more, and return, Agent. Agent exits the room, and opens the one next to it. Again, it is identical to the first two. Agent. She can't be here. Control. What, Agent? What's through this door? Agent. My old girlfriend. But she's married now, expecting a kid. The person in the room can't be her. Control. Noted. Return, Agent. Agent lowers the camera, and only the floor can be seen. Agent. I want to make it right, baby. Shh. It's okay. Don't cry. It was all my fault. Footsteps are heard, and then a soft, incomprehensible crooning from Agent Control. Agent, did you hear me? Agent, I'm so sorry I let you go. Don't you worry. It won't happen again. Control. Agent, you will turn around, close the door, and return to the outside. That is an order. Agent, with all due respect, sir, no. I can make it work this time. At this point, the camera is lifted, and then the feed is abruptly ended. Addendum 398B After loss of Agent Class D personnel are to be sent into SCP-398. Personnel D-193 and D-216 are sent equipped with handheld video cameras to explore further. Transcription of audio follows. Begin log. Skip to 0 hours 12 minutes 41 seconds. Control. Right, you two. Continue onward. D-193. Understood. Transmission shows the same hall scene in Addendum 398A. D-193 appears to be in front of D-216. D-216's feed shows D-193 walking ahead of him. D-193. There are doors. Shall I open one? Control. No. Continue onwards. The Class D personnel continues. After a few meters, D-216 gasps. Control. D-216. What's wrong? No answer is heard. D-193. He seems to be unconscious, sir. Control. His vitals have dropped out. He's dead. Leave him and continue, 193. D-193. Roger, sir. Several seconds pass. D-193. The hall's changing, sir. The feed shows no change. Control. Describe. D-193. It's starting to look like the corridor outside of my old cell. I never wanted to see this again. But it looks like it gets better just up ahead. Control. Noted. Open the door to your left, 193. D-193 opens the door. It is identical to the room seen in Addendum 398A. A burst of breath is heard from D-193. His heart rate rises. Control. What is it, 193? D-193. It's the basement we had in a house I lived in as a child. I always hated it. I never went in. D-193's voice is shaky. D-193. Oh god. Can you hear that? There are voices. Something's down there. Nothing can be heard except D-193's breathing. Control. What are they saying, 193? D-193. I don't know. But I'm getting out of here. It will get better further on. It has to. 
D-193 starts to run on down the hall. Control. Negative D-193. Return at once. D-193. I can't, sir. It's terrible back there. It will be better further on. Much better. The log continues for several minutes, until the feed is inexplicably cut off. End log. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.